come up with a new climate treaty, and it's our last really plausible bite at the apple, I think, to get it right. We now have a number that defines that process. Jim Hansen at NASA, who I think may be arrested today with us all, said his team uh, last year said 350 parts per million carbon dioxide is the most we can have in the atmosphere if we wish to retain a planet similar to the one on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Pretty strong language. We're above that number now. We're at 387 parts per million and rising. We need really dramatic action really quickly to bring it down, which is why at 350.org we're assembling this global grassroots movement. And on October 24th, there'll be demonstrations every corner of the world, from high up in the Himalayas to 350 scuba divers underwater in the Great Barrier Reef to people out on Easter Island, the, the kind of poster child for what happens when you don't take care of your environment. Uh, all trying to get this number across so that our negotiators actually have some target they have to hit, so that they can't come back from Copenhagen and just say, oh, you know, we've reached an agreement. Not good enough. We're now up against the wall, and if we don't get a really strong agreement really soon, then we all might as well not even go through the process. I want to turn now to an ad that CNN reportedly refused to play last week. It's about the coal industry and so-called clean coal. The website Think Progress Now reports that CNN will be playing the ad this week. Smells so clean. Mm -hmm. Is regular clean clean enough for your family? Not when you can have clean coal clean. Clean coal harnesses the awesome power of the word clean. To make it sound like the cleanest clean there is. Clean Coal is supported by the coal industry, the most trusted name in coal. Judy Bonds, your response. That's how we live. That that dust of, of gray, black soot that they're spraying out, that's basically what's in our homes and in our lungs. And I'm certainly glad that CNN has changed their mind and will air that ad because that ad is, is true. Clean coal is a dirty lie. It's a dirty lie. No, clean coal does not exist. And uh, if people could actually, you know, look at a coal fire power plant or come to Appalachia and see how they extract coal, then they would understand what we mean when we say clean coal is a dirty lie. They would understand that commercial completely. And I hope, you know, America gets a chance to see more and more and more of this commercial because I think this commercial is, is, is so true about what our children are breathing to in the inner cities. Thank you both for being there. Uh, Judy Bonds, thank you for joining us. Appalachian environmental activist from West Virginia, director of Coal River Mountain Watch, and also want to thank Bill McKibben, author of Deep Economy, The Wealth of Communities and the Durable Future, among other books, co-founder of the environmental group called 350.org. As we turn now to Van Jones, he was one of the major speakers this weekend. Coal, of course, a key focus of the discussions at this weekend's power shift conference. Van Jones is the author of The Green Collar Economy. All that clean coal stuff. All that clean coal stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, we could have clean coal. I'm for clean coal, but I'll tell you what, if we're going to have clean coal, let's have a couple other things. We could have clean coal, or if we can, we could power the country with clean coal, or we could have unicorns pull our cars for us, so, you know, all day. We could have that, too. Equally fictitious, equally fantastical, equally ludicrous, you know. So, you know, we could have the tooth fairy bring us our energy at night. I mean, equally ludicrous. There is no such thing as a tooth fairy. There is no such thing as unicorns. And there is no such thing as clean coal. So let's be clear about that. Let's be clear about that. 
Van Jones, author of Green Collar Economy, speaking at this weekend's Power Shift conference. It took place at the Washington Convention Center. An estimated 12,000 young people were there for the conference, the largest youth summit on climate change in history. College and high school students from all 50 states, Canadian provinces, as well as a dozen countries came to together to discuss organizing for a clean energy revolution on the local and national levels. Well, Democracy Now!'s own producer, Nicole Salazar, headed down as well and spoke with some of the students about why they came to PowerShift 09. Hey, what's up? My name is Martin Macias, Jr. I'm 19 years old from Chicago, Illinois. I live about two, uh, two miles away from two of the biggest coal power plants in the Midwest region and the only two coal power plants in Chicago. It's responsible for about 50 deaths a year in my neighborhood and um, it's responsible for toxic air, toxic soil. If you look at the demographics of these communities, it's mostly Latino working class immigrants. It doesn't employ anyone from our neighborhood and we don't get any energy. In Michigan right now, we're in a very strong battle over the future that Michigan's gonna take. We currently have 19 coal-fired power plants, three nuclear power plants. We have declining energy needs, and yet there's somehow an idea that there's an energy crisis, and we need to move forward with eight new coal-fired power plants immediately in order to make sure the lights don't go off, which is absolutely a fallacy. Um, Michigan is home to nearly 20% of global fresh water, um, we've got fishing advisories on all of our fish in the Great Lakes, as well as our 1,100 inland lakes, and definitely the largest single source of mercury contamination, for example, just to take one element of the contamination, is from the coal-fired power plants. We don't have any coal in Michigan, so we do import all of it, which is a huge cost to our state. A lot of the people who have made investments in renewables are upset they've got to go to Canada or other states or Germany to buy the parts when we've got all the manpower we need in Michigan and all the empty factory space to be doing that work there. My name is James Douglas Noble. I'm from Hazard, Kentucky. The issues in my county that are the reason I'm here is mainly coal mining or mountaintop removal or deep mining, either one. Um, my whole entire family, they work in the, in, oh, mainly on the strip mines or the surface mines. And I've actually seen two of my friends die in the coal mines because of, of like, they had a, there was a cave in one time and one guy died and the other guy, he just died because of lung complications. I feel that we need to give them something else other than coal and bring in a sustainable energy or a sustainable job at least because coal runs out. My name is Kim Smith. I am from Arizona. They did uranium mining on the Navajo Nation uh, for over 30 years. And when Navajo people were working in these uranium mines, they weren't given any protection. They weren't given any information on the hazards of uranium mining. And so right now there are a lot of people who were working in those uranium mining and they have cancer. And so they're trying to be compensated for that and they're just learning about what the hazards really are. And they had a uranium spill in the 70s, and to this day, we're not able to use that water where the uranium spill happened. Hobbs is just a small rural town right on the edge of Texas. It's, I'd say, 95% dominated by oil and gas industry. But with the decline of oil production, the industries that they've decided to bring in to help jumpstart our economy are a prison, a casino, and more recently, the one that worries me the most is a nuclear enrichment plant, which I learned about last night. They received their first shipment of uranium last night. A lot of my friends and my father have worked there in the refineries and, you know, they've gotten injured and, you know, it's just not the most safe work environment. If they don't have that good of an education, but they want to be able to support their families with a good career, they choose to do this. But the unfortunate thing is a lot of times that work doesn't have much career mobility. You know, my father's been working in the oil industry for 30 years. He's an awesome worker, yet they've hardly given him any opportunities to move up in the career ladder, and I know he would be doing a fantastic job if he'd had that opportunity. Essentially, when you look at, you know, African Americans as a whole, we can certainly see that, um, you know, as the movements are happening, African Americans simply aren't getting the knowledge that's necessary. So we are not understanding the facts that, you know, climate change is a real threat and people aren't basically telling them that climate change is an actual threat that is harming them in their communities. For instance, um, during the summertime in areas known as heat islands, African Americans are more likely to live in those areas and as a result get uh, adverse health issues and Howard University being an HBCU, we see it as our duty to make sure we spearhead this and make sure that African Americans are more informed of these issues. 
there were two reasons why I wanted to be here in PowerShift. One, to learn how an event of such a scale can be held, how, how to get people there, how to get people working, and how best to achieve what you want to achieve. And secondly, to see if such a thing could be emulated perhaps in India and uh, do that. And that was, and also to contribute my bit as a representative from the global south in india it's for a lot of people it's the question of survival a lot of people still don't get electricity so for them it's not a question of getting clean electricity or not for them they need if they are in in the mountains what they need is light what they need is heat we want to eliminate this misconception that green energy has to be expensive in a country like india where we have a lot of sun a lot of wind solar and wind power are great and if they connected to the grid then of course things can be done and yeah we are trying our best um Puerto Rico we have great um, waste management issues um we do not have proper facilities to store all the waste that we produce our landfills have, have not been properly um, um constructed in and, and